In the wake of a decade of terrorism after 9-11, Catholics have more questions than ever about Islam. What does this faith really teach? And how can we bring the good news of Jesus Christ to our Muslim friends and neighbors? Today, we'll discuss the challenge of Islam with our special guest, the founder of Jihad Watch, Robert Spencer. I'm Dr. Scott Hahn, Professor of Biblical Theology at Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio, and you're watching Franciscan University Presents. Stay with us. Catholics need to know about Islam? That's our topic today on Franciscan University Presents. I'm Dr. Scott Hahn, Professor of Biblical Theology at Franciscan University, filling in today for Father Michael Scanlon. We're here with our panelists, Dr. Regis Martin, Professor of Systematic Theology, and Dr. Michael Cirillo, Professor of Theology at Franciscan University of Steubenville. Our special guest today is Robert Spencer. He has a master's degree in religious studies from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He's been studying Islamic theology, law, and history for over 30 years, beginning when he read the Quran at the invitation of Palestinian and Saudi Muslims. As the founder of Jihad Watch, he has been sought after by dozens of print and television journalists worldwide, and he's the author of numerous books, including Inside Islam, A Guide for Catholics. Robert. You say that you were not surprised by the terrorist attacks of 9-11. Why? Everybody else was. Well, Scott, you know, you mentioned that I first read the Quran in the early 80s, and anybody who reads the Quran with open eyes is going to see that there's a martial theology in Islam and that the Quran teaches warfare against unbelievers and their subjugation. And I saw that also at the same time that I was reading the Quran. It was around the time that uh, the Iranian hostage crisis had just been concluded and the Islamic Republic of Iran was uh, coming out in full force. And it was clear that the Ayatollah Khomeini was basing all that he was doing on the teachings of the Quran and the teachings of Muhammad, the prophet of Islam. And that the, the uh, warfare that they considered that they needed to pursue against the United States and other infidel nations was based on Islamic principles. And so when 9-11 happened, that was also after other attacks like the attack on the USS Cole and the attack on the uh, embassies in Africa and so on. And these also were perpetrated by Muslims acting explicitly and proudly in the name of Islam. So when I saw 9-11 happen, I, I thought, well, this is something that was coming for a long time. So resurgent Islam is not just a contemporary event, but something that really calls for historical context? Oh, very much so, yes, because the contemporary Islamic Jihad movements, uh, notably Al-Qaeda, but not limited to Al-Qaeda, certainly also you have to add in the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, since the uh, Hamas movement in Israel considers itself to be the Muslim Brotherhood for Palestine, and uh, other jihad organizations that started in the 20th century, they self-consciously cast themselves <coughs> as uh, intending to reassert the prerogatives of political Islam and ultimately to restore the caliphate, which was the supranational unity of the Muslims, united under the successor of Muhammad, the caliph, who was the political, spiritual, and military leader of the Muslims and the only person under Sunni Islamic law authorized to wage offensive jihad and indeed having the responsibility to wage offensive jihad against infidel nations and to bring them under the rule of Islamic law in which non-Muslims are deprived of basic rights. Hmm. Yeah, well, Robert, uh, you make everything sound as plain as a pumpkin. Uh, <laughs> you weren't surprised. Uh, we were, and apparently uh, uh, the president was surprised Certainly. by 9-11. Uh, the, the members of the Joint Chiefs, <coughs> uh, everybody was taken by surprise. And if we need this historical context, why would these men exercising that kind of national responsibility have been so culpably uh, innocent, ignorant of, of these matters? Well, this goes back, this is also something that goes back decades itself. Uh, I know that at the time of the Islamic Revolution in Iran, and when Khomeini came to power, this also completely blindsided the State Department, 
and the White House at that time. And it was because they had completely discounted Khomeini's influence and they had completely underestimated the power of Islamic uh, preaching and the appeal of the rule of Islamic law for ordinary Muslims. Right. So there was only one book written by Khomeini anywhere in the State Department at the time he took power and no one had read it. And this came out later yeah. that they were completely unprepared. And I think that it, it's an ongoing cultural problem within the right. State Department and official Washington. And it actually goes back to the fact that these people are generally State Department people, diplomats and so on, are generally secularists who do not understand and underestimate the appeal and power of a religious call to that's responsibility. A key, that's a key factor because I think at the time the only enemy in their sights was Soviet communism. Exactly. Yeah. And so we looked at radical Muslims as allies in the one and only real war, oh, which was against yes. communism. And so really, not until the Iron Curtain collapses in 89, do people really wake up and realize there's almost a sense in which this was camouflage, a distraction from an enemy that has been perennial now for ages, for yes. centuries. Yes. It doesn't seem that 9-11 assisted the State Department in adjusting their approach yeah. here. For example, right. the Arab Springtime in, in the Middle East and in North Africa, uh, we're adopting these same policies. We don't, I think, realize that what's coming on the horizon is clearly Sharia. Yes. And yeah. the Christians in North Africa are all are all calling for help. Oh, yeah, it doesn't no seem like there's it. been 9-11 helped us to adjust. Yeah, it didn't. You, you know, if, if you had to reach back uh, uh, into uh, recent history for some parallel, I, I think uh, the example of Hitler, the rise of uh, fascism, mm -hmm. Mein Kampf, uh, pretty much advertises what's coming. Yes. Uh, and, and apparently back then people were utterly ignorant of, of, of this call to arms. Yes. If yeah. violence is implicit, uh, if it's part of the logic, of Islam, then why were we so sluggish in taking note of it? There's been a Middle East crisis for centuries. Well, there's several things. Remember also that in Afghanistan, the uh, CIA and the State Department actually uh, partnered with some of the jihadi groups that were fighting yeah. against the Soviets. Absolutely. And as you were saying, Scott, they saw everything in these bipolar terms. You're yeah. either with the Soviets or with us. And then combine that with the ongoing campaign, the very sophisticated and elaborate campaign of deception that Muslim Brotherhood-led groups in the United States have been carrying out to convey the proposition that's wholly false, that Islam is a religion of peace yeah. and that it teaches tolerance and that there is nothing in it that anybody needs to be concerned about in regard to warfare against unbelievers or the subjugation of okay. religious minorities in Islamic states. Now I realize there might be other factors you could enumerate, but I want to stop you right there because you use the key phrase, a religion of peace. When we look at Islam, we can look at it in political terms, we can also look at it in religious terms. And that's the way I think most people begin, because after all, it traces itself back to Abraham. It is monotheistic. It has a sacred book like we do. It believes in a prophet, the five pillars. You have pilgrimages and this sort of thing. You have a kind of liturgical calendar. And so on the surface, there are some <coughs> profound similarities to Judaism or to Christianity and especially our own Catholic experience. And yet, this idea that Islam is a religion of peace, why is it that you feel that it's really not? Well, you know, Scott, in the first place, I have to say, uh, just in terms of clarifying, that uh, it's perfectly understandable why Muslims who are absolutely truthful say Islam is a religion of peace, but they're envisioning peace in a radically different way from what we consider to be peace. Explain. Uh, Islam is the, a, a political and social system as well as a religious one, mm -hmm. and it always has been. And the rule of Islamic law, Sharia, is considered to be the perfect model for society. And once it's implemented, then there's peace. And so Islam is a religion of peace, but Muslims must wage war in order to impose that peace <laughs> upon the rest of us. Now explain that doctrine because isn't the world divided, I mean literally and technically in yes. Islamic sources into these two areas? Yes, it's a later, uh, it's not in the Quran itself, right. it's a later elaboration by Islamic theologians, but the uh, world is divided into the Dar al-Islam and the Dar al-Harb. The Dar al-Islam is the house of Islam and then the house of war is the Dar al-Harb. So there's a house of peace because Islam means submission, but it also kind of plays on the word for peace. Well, in, in, in Arabic, Arabic as in Hebrew, 
Hebrew, words are all built up from three consonants, right. the three consonant base. And so the uh, word Islam is SLM, and then that's also Salam, which is right. peace. Shalom. So they're etymologically tied, but actually the peace that is in Islam is the peace that comes through submission, which is yeah. not just submission to God, right. but also submission to the Islamic social order, which is considered to be the law of God. This is an incredibly deceptive business, uh, because superficially when you look at Muslims, uh, uh, you're struck by their piety. I mean, yeah. these are guys who pray, what, five times a day. That's right. Uh, Allah wanted them to do it 50 times a day, yeah. but he had to make certain pragmatic adjustments. Uh, and they, they, they seem to be incredibly devout. Uh, and yet underneath, there is this seething cauldron of hatred for the West. Well, you know, actually, it's the same thing. The piety and the seething cauldron of hatred come from the same wellspring because it is in the basic text, it's in the Quran. The unbelievers, the unbelievers among the people of the book, that's the term, and the people of the book refers to primarily Jews and Christians, and the unbelievers among the people of the book are those Jews and Christians who do not accept Muhammad as a prophet or the Quran as the word of God. So in other words, essentially all Jews and Christians. The unbelievers among the people of the book are called in chapter 98, verse 6 of the Quran, the most vile of created beings. And in chapter 48, verse 29, it says, Muhammad is the apostle of Allah. Those who follow him are merciful to one another, but ruthless to the unbelievers. And so the ruthlessness or the harshness to the unbelievers, you see, is yeah, exactly right. the same motion of piety as being merciful to the Muslims. Right. You know, there's, there's something yeah. here that uh, calls for a little closer attention. Because when you say unbelievers, you know, I, I, I think we immediately think of secularized Western civilization. What do Catholics, not just Westerners, but what do Catholics in particular have to become more aware of when it comes to Islamic resurgence? Well, I'll tell you one other quote from the Quran that appears twice at uh, chapter 5, verse 17 and 5, verse 72, is that infidels, unbelievers, are those who say Allah is the Messiah, Jesus the Son of Mary. In other words, that is generally understood to be that if you say Jesus is divine, then you are a kafar, an unbeliever. Uh -huh. And that is the word that's used in, that, in those verses. Yeah, and, and off so, with your head. Well, either off with your head or if you submit right, yeah. and accept a subservient position, being yeah. deprived of basic rights. Pay a tax. Exactly. Yeah. You pay the tax, can't build new churches or repair old ones. You can't have public displays of the faith. You know, the Eastern uh, churches, Catholic and Orthodox, they don't have any uh, uh, kind of a, of a tradition of ringing bells because the bells are forbidden. And uh, there are processions, but they were forbidden from having the processions out into the city like they did in, in Catholic yeah, Europe. That's the yeah. state called dimitude, yes? Yes, no? exactly. Okay. Yeah. And the dimma is the contract of protection. It's kind of like uh, uh, Don Corleone. Right? Yeah. Will give well, you, you quote uh, chapter and verse as if you have really read this book. I, I actually uh, have read it <laughs> once or twice. In Arabic? Because apparently that's the only permitted uh, language. Well, I, uh, my Arabic is, is, is not so hot, but uh, oh, I, yeah. I can read some. And I, I can read enough in Arabic to yeah. know, for example, that some of the translations in English are uh, a little bit sanitized. I see. Like if you look at Abdullah Yusuf Ali's translation, which is one of the most common translations, in uh -huh. English at uh, Surah 434, chapter 4, verse 34. It says uh, that's the one about uh, beat. If, if good women are obedient, as for those oh, that right. are not, right. warn them, send them to separate beds, and beat them. And in his translation, it says beat them lightly. But I the know. lightly is not in the Arabic. <laughs> oh, I see. There's not even a mitigating service. Yes, but you're well, quite well, right. Uh, Muslims generally well, understand it's standard Islamic theology. Well, maybe to let some of these people Arabic. off the hook. Uh, they don't understand what they read because they don't know Arabic. Oh, you're quite right. And so right. they don't obtain the grace, but they submit anyway. Yes. Well, see, this is the thing. If, you, if you're in school in Pakistan, then you're going to learn Quran primarily and only Quran. You'll probably memorize the whole thing. Yeah. And when I, uh, often when I'm giving talks, I tell this story and people think it's a joke. But the man was very serious. I was speaking a few years back to a Pakistani Muslim. And he said, I'm very proud of my religion, and I have memorized almost the whole Quran. And one day, I'm going to get one of those translations and find out what it means. Yeah. Because, you know, we know in the days of the Latin Mass, there was the Latin on the one side and the English on the other. But you go to uh, the, the mosque, you have to pray in Arabic, you recite Quran in Arabic, and there's no interlinear translation available. Well, this is really You're scary. You're just mouthing syllables. Sheer syllable. mystification, but harness to great power. Yes. You know, but you also are pointing to an an important distinction, a fundamental difference between Christianity and Islam 
because you referred to how they deny divine sonship for Jesus and especially for us. And they affirm a divine, a divine slavery, a, a, a divine servitude. Therein lies freedom. Divine sonship, therein lies blasphemy. You know? And I think when we recognize that principle of servility, we really get to the heart or the inner logic of this, uh, of this religion and why it, it, it kind of uh, it affects people the way it does, politically but also psychologically. Oh, absolutely. It's very much a master-slave relationship. Yeah. So but the it's good confusing because in, in our faith, submission and surrender to God is a central component. Yes. And it, we also teach that it brings peace. But here's a profound difference. It's not just the difference of sonship and slavery or servitude, but it's also this, that there is a, a consistent and systemic denial in Islamic thought that we're created in the image and likeness of God. Oh, very okay, much nobody so. We need to God. pick up here right after the okay. break when we're going to look at yeah. what Islam teaches about Christ and his yeah. church. You're watching Franciscan University Presents. Stay with us. One thing that I try to do in my classes is to encourage our students to actually read the Quran and to see what it really says, not that they're getting it from somebody misquoting it, or maybe some Islamic fundamentalist could misinterpret the Quran, and so it's better always to go to the first source. And so while our students are reluctant maybe to read something from another religion, I really encourage them to get to know the Quran a little bit better. My name is Michael Villanueva. I'm majoring in philosophy and theology. Last semester I had sacraments with Dr. Han, and uh, I'll tell you right now, it was the best class of my entire life. Every class, I'm just knocked out of my chair. It hits me like a ton of bricks. The beauty of the truth that he's speaking to us. Something so simple, God's but so beautiful and so profound and so powerful. Franciscan University is academically excellent and passionately Catholic. I'm Scott Hahn with two of my colleagues, Regis Martin and Mike Cirilla, and our special guest, Robert Spencer. And we're talking about Catholics and Islam. Robert, what are the authoritative sources of Islamic teaching, and what do they have to say about, say, Jesus and Mary? The authoritative sources are the Quran and the Sunnah. The Quran is the holy book that is considered to be a perfect copy of the eternal book that has existed forever with Allah and was delivered in perfect form over a period of 23 years through the angel Gabriel to Muhammad. And then the, the Quran, being uh, rather elliptical and, uh, and gnomic in many ways, <laughs> is uh, uh, filled out by the Hadith, which are voluminous. You'd need a wheelbarrow or maybe several wheelbarrows to carry all the volumes of the Hadith. And they are stories of Muhammad's words and deeds, which are authoritative because in the Quran, Muslims are commanded to obey Muhammad as well as Allah, and he is called the excellent example of conduct that is the supreme guide for behavior for Muslims. Now, I've read the Quran. Right. I've read the Quran in translation a few times, and I've noticed from the outset it's not chronological in any way like our Bible. It isn't really even logical or theological. It sort of seems decontextualized. Very much so. It's yeah. uh, essentially uh, a, a series of. Uh, of uh, uh, kind of like sermons, yeah. uh, uh, exhortations Probably. of various ways, mostly just denunciations of the unbelievers, with various stories of biblical prophets added in that all have an exact parallel to the experience of Muhammad himself. In other words, Muhammad meets with scorn and derision, and he denounces the unbelievers and says they will ultimately uh, be punished in hell and punished in this world as well. And then you read stories of Noah, of Moses, of David, and, and Solomon, and so on in the Quran, of Joseph and mm -hmm. Jacob, and they're all, they all run along the same lines. Yeah. And it seems clear that what they're trying, what, he's, what the point always is, is to say, see, the other prophets went through exactly the same thing, and now you unbelievers are treating Muhammad in the same way, and you're going to receive the same punishment. There are broad patches of, of teaching about virtue and piety as well, but what does the Quran have to say about Jesus and Mary? In, in the Quran, Jesus is a prophet. He's the last prophet before Muhammad, All right. and he uh, prophesies the coming of Muhammad yeah. in the Quran. Uh, he is, uh, the Christians are warned numerous times in the Quran that it not only does Allah not have a son, 
and that Jesus is not the Son of God, but that it is an insult to the transcendent majesty of Allah to yep. say that Jesus has a son, and tantamount to associating partners with Allah in worship, deifying a human being, and thus committing the cardinal sin of shirk, which is essentially polytheism or worshiping others besides Allah. Uh -huh. uh, and he is, uh, although there are traces at the same time of Christian theology in that he's characterized as the word of God, and is uh, in the, not in the Quran, but in Islamic tradition, identified as sinless and as the prophet who's going to come back at the end of the world, although when he does, he's going to make war against Christianity. In the Quran, uh, he is uh, born of a virgin, and there's a, a chapter called Mary, chapter 19, which uh, uh, details the virgin birth and uh, even the Annunciation, but without saying that, of course, the uh, child will be holy and the Son of God. And uh, Jesus is... Uh, we are also told that uh, he appears before Allah and Allah asks him, did you tell your followers to take yourself and your mother as gods alongside me? Uh, if evidently that was Muhammad's idea of the Trinity was Allah and Mary and Jesus. And he says, oh no, how could I say that when I wasn't authorized to do so? And uh, we are also told that he does not die on the cross, but it only appeared as if he died on the cross. Yeah. And uh, So that somebody was made to look like Jesus by Allah, and he yes. died instead to yes. fool the... Well, this is, a, this is a real stolen base, because if, if what they are saying uh, is true, then we are the apostates. Oh, quite we so. We are traitorous uh, to the true teachings of, of Jesus, who yes. only prepares the way for this real special guy. That's uh, quite the right. The protagonist the, the, of the in, story. In Islamic theology, not only Jesus, but all the prophets of the Old Testament are considered to be Muslim prophets. And uh, Abraham, in, in chapter 3, verse 67, is specifically identified as a Muslim. So they, they've co-opted everything. We'll see all the prophets and Jesus were Muslims yeah. who taught Islam, and then their wicked followers, for reasons of their own personal gain, yeah. twisted their teachings to create the false religions of Judaism and Christianity. And now, here's, a, here's a twist. Uh, isn't there a chronological problem with the identification of Mary as Miriam? Yes, there is. The, the sister of Moses? Yes, in Arabic. And that, and that actually, there is, is evidence from natural historiography that, that, that refutes that. Oh, well, it's And, uh, and it's so the twistedness clear. is on the part of the chronology found in the chapter on Mary. Well, see, it's a funny thing because... Uh, it seems. It, it's not in the chapter... Well, actually, uh, I believe it is there, but it's also in chapter 3, the family of Imran, and that's very important, uh, as, as I'll explain. Uh, Mar the, in, in Arabic, the word is the same for Miriam, the sister of Moses and Aaron, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, it's Maryam. And so uh, Muhammad apparently confused the two. And he also is, it's also presented in the Quran that all the prophets are of the same household and are essentially related. And so in the uh, Quran, Mary is twice called sister of Aaron. And Muhammad, uh, there is a hadith, because apparently Christians from very early on were deriding this and saying, you got this wrong, you're thinking that uh, centuries Jesus is Moses' nephew when right, he's right. Uh, much later. And uh, they, there's a hadith in which Muhammad is approached and asked about this, and he says, no, 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 sister of Aaron is just uh, a, an expression of respect, and it doesn't mean oh, okay. literal sister of Aaron. Oh. But the problem with that is that she's called sister of Aaron in the chapter 3 of the Quran, which is entitled the family of Imran. Imran in the Quran is Moses' father. And so the whole thing is about the family of Moses. And Mary comes in and is called Aaron's sister. It's very clear that that is absolutely what is meant, but it was just caught early on, and this apologetic excuse but fashions to explain it. In that chapter on Mary, though, what is stated positively about Our Lady? Well, it's uh, clear that she's very pious, and uh, she is holy. And as a matter of fact, she also, along with her son, are, they are both identified as sinless in Islamic tradition. Uh -huh. And uh, she is, uh, the virgin birth is presented uh, quite forthrightly, and she is uh, tr uh, described with great respect. And so also is Jesus, although he has uh, less to do in the Quran. Uh, nonetheless, he is spoken about quite often and always in uh, glowing terms. As a matter of fact, there's some aspects of Gnostic Gospels yeah. in which he speaks from the cradle in the same chapter of Mary and uh, in which he, uh, when he's a child, fashions clay birds and then claps his hands and they fly away uh -huh. and so on. And uh, this kind of thing is striking because Muhammad several times, we're told in the Quran, 
is challenged to produce a miracle, and he can't. And he just says the Quran itself is the miracle, and that's all they're going to get. And so Jesus, in certain sense, has greater powers than Muhammad, and there are things about him that do not apply to Muhammad, like the second coming and like the, uh, uh, the sinlessness and uh, the fact that he is the word of God and yeah. born of a virgin. But I mean, he, he presents himself with, with some fairly divine pretensions. Uh, how do they cope with that? How do they strip him of, of these so-called divine attributes? He claims to be God. Before Abraham was, I am. I mean, how do well, they this is the corruption that? of the Injil. Yeah. Yeah. We, oh, we, oh I, we hallucinated all this. We corrupted, we, we corrupted it for venal religion. purposes. The Injil, like the Torah, are yeah. both corrupted by Christians and Jesus Jews. Jesus was given a book in, yes. the, in the Quran the gospel is not considered to be the good news of Jesus Christ, but it is right. a book that he received from Allah the way Muhammad received the Quran. Yes. And then that book, which was a Muslim book that taught Islam, was corrupted by the Christians to create right. what we call the New Testament. Oh, and they speak of that as the Injil, the gospel, yes. just like the Jews have the Torah, the, the law. So, both of these have been corrupted. So we, we really yes. ought to be grateful to, to uh, the Muslims because they want to disabuse us of these historical lies. That's absolutely the standard okay. Islamic view of this. And which makes yes. it easier, I think, to submit because they're doing us a great favor and liberating us. From yes, and they make historical use of modern biblical powers. criticism, the Jesus seminar kind of thing that says yeah. none of these things are historical or this is and that isn't. And they say, see, this is evidence that yeah. your scriptures are corrupted. And so you have to get the full true thing in the yeah. Quran itself. Well, the founder of this religion was a real piece of work himself. I mean, uh, here is a guy who impregnates a nine-year-old uh, girl who, who becomes his wife, and, and that sort of sets the standard. I, well, I think you had mentioned marriage. marriage. Yeah, you, had, the, uh, you had mentioned the other day that uh, after the fall of the Taliban, when they go into these refugee camps, they're, uh, they're astonished by the number of nine-year-old wives. Yes, uh, you know, because well, well, Muhammad is the excellent example of conduct. To, to so be fair, he did it, it's good. To be fair here, we're talking about the ancient and early medieval world. Augustine, uh, before his conversion, was, was engaged to be married to a nine-year-old. Mm -hmm. Okay, <coughs> so you have a, yeah. well, I think what we have is, is in Christianity and contemporary Judaism, we've moved beyond a number of yeah. Anomalies. You know, well, see, what again, Islam exactly does not it. seem to have moved. What, what I think Muhammad we recognize. Is, go ahead. Go ahead. Because Muhammad is the excellent example of conduct. Yeah. Uh, what his 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 example is normative in every way. Right. And so yes, it's certainly true, and I think it's noteworthy that there are several aspects of Islamic, uh, the the Islamic uh, biographies of Muhammad that clearly embarrassed Muslims at the time. Like uh -huh. when he uh, set things up so that he could marry his former daughter-in-law who was very beautiful. And that caused a lot of scandal and he had to explain it. And uh, this was clearly a source of embarrassment. But there's no embarrassment at all in the stories about the consummation of the marriage with Aisha when she was nine. It's taken for granted this is a normal thing to do. Yeah. The problem becomes when it's considered to be a normal thing to do now so many centuries later when we know the physical and psychological harm that can do to girls and yet because Muhammad did it, there's no headway that can be right. made against it right. in the Islamic world. You know, in dialogue we need a, a balance between clarity and charity, precision, but at the same time openness. You know, and it's hard because you know, we understand from Muslims that Muhammad is really an exemplar of righteousness. Oh, yeah. If he's done it, then it's all right. You know, if, if somebody in the name of Jesus goes out and strikes terror and butchers people, everybody knows he has contradicted what the founder of Christianity did. Whereas if people go out <coughs> and in the name of Islam imitate Muhammad and exercise force, violence, and terror, there's almost a sense of continuity and consistency. Oh, very much so. That's part of the obedience. That's part of the imitation of Muhammad that's required. That's hard for us to really admit. I mean, it's, it's hard to kind of face up to that because of the conditioning I think we've received spiritually and culturally. Oh, yeah. Well, people think in the first place that uh, if you speak about these things, it's somehow impolite or wrong because 
uh, all religions are basically good. And uh, while the, the Catholic Church, of course, we understand that the fullness of the truth is in the church, whereas other uh, uh, religious traditions have only partial truths, some to a greater degree or lesser degree than others, but uh, it's still, it's, it's, it's considered to be sort of outside the realm of possibility yeah. that there could be the founder of a religion who says something like, as Muhammad said, I have been made victorious through terror, right. or I have been commanded to fight against people until they confess that there's no God but Allah and I am his messenger, uh, and so many other things that Muhammad said and did that go against standard notions of human rights and morality. Yeah. People can't conceive of that as well, a Well, I mean, some of, some of this stuff is fairly preposterous on the face of it, like the creation of the world, that God, Allah, strikes the right shoulder of, of Adam, and white people come out, and then the left shoulder is struck, and you've got black people who, of course, are going to go to hell. Yes. Uh, what, how, how can this commend itself to any person of reason? Well, you know, a lot of uh, times when you're talking about com the, the, these features of Islam, even Muslims are not aware of them. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm aware of the hadith you're talking about, about striking the right shoulder and the left shoulder. And I was also conscious when I was quoting those just now, I've been made victorious through terror and so on. These things are in the canonical right. hadith collections that Muslims yeah. accept as authentic. But those being so voluminous and the Arabic language barrier, since most Muslims in the world today are not Arabs, and even yeah. the Arabs don't speak 7th century Quranic Arabic, uh, th a lot of them are not even familiar with these things. And I have to keep in mind, even when I'm speaking about Islam, if there are Muslims in the audience and they say, none of this is true, I think, well, maybe you don't know these things are in there, yeah. but they are. You know, we have the challenge of dialogue we have to address, because here's our Lord Jesus, who dialogues not only with his disciples, but with Pilate, with Caiaphas, with Herod, and the apostles go out and do the same, and so must we. Up next, we're going to look at how the church can most fruitfully reach out to Islam and its followers in dialogue. Stay with us. I grew up with many Muslim friends uh, in Singapore, and with these Muslim friends, I did not see the level of radical terrorism that we see and associate with the Muslim faith today. In fact, they shared a very firm foundation in, in, in terms of who we are as human beings created by God. So much so that when I shared with a group of people about the Catholic worldview of media, at the end of my presentation, one of the students stood up and she said that she is Muslim and she shared how what I shared, which is the Catholic worldview of media, is used and can be used in Muslim schools. Cardinal Lorenze, Francis Lorenze, visited Franciscan University. He spoke about Islam to our student body. And at that time, he was the prefect of the congregation of the Vatican relating to non-Christian religions. <clears throat> and he sp said that Islam is diverse, that um, there are forms of fundamentalist or, or uh, uh, jihadist Islam, which of course are very inimical to Christianity and to to human life and culture. But he said that we have to remember, though, that not all Muslims are uh, of this breed, and that r rather we should try to, to seek dialogue with those uh, Muslims who, who really have a different view. And this is actually the call of the Second Vatican Council, which calls us to dialogue and to seek what is good and holy in other religions. So this is our task, to uh, distinguish between the different forms of Islam, dialoguing and finding common ground with those Muslims who, who share some of our values and might be open to uh, working with us in the betterment of human culture. Welcome back. We're here at Franciscan University of Steubenville, surrounded by our students working the equipment with our special guest, Robert Spencer. Robert, Muslims might say that you're just cherry picking from their sources. How would you respond? Well, this is a very important question because we just were talking about how uh, the many Muslims might not even be aware 
of some of the uh, noxious and uh, difficult elements of the Quran and of the Sunnah, the Hadith and the uh, legal apparatus that's uh, derived from it. And while that's true, at the same time, there are international movements of Muslims, uh, really in all, uh, every continent and in most of the nations of the world, uh, in which Muslims explicitly and avowedly are acting upon the passages exhorting to warfare and subjugation of the unbelievers, the hatred and contempt of unbelievers that is taught in the Quran. They know full well those passages are there, and they're the ones who are bringing them to public notice by explaining and justifying their acts of terrorism on the basis of these passages. So as Catholics, we should be aware of those texts, but at the same time, in order to facilitate whatever dialogue might be possible and fruitful. What examples can you think of? I mean, I, 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 Father Zechariah Boutros or St. Francis and the Sultan, uh, Blessed Charles de Foucault. What do these men share with us? What, what do they teach us about this? Well, uh, those dialogue? are three great heroes and uh, very different, each one. Touch on them. From one another. Uh, Father Zechariah Boutros is contemporary. Right. He is a, an elderly Coptic priest who uh, has a television show in Arabic that airs in Egypt. And uh, he. Uh, he does essentially uh, what I do, although I don't do it nearly as well. Uh, he quotes Muslim texts, and he quotes them back to Muslims and says, well, these things, this is what this says, and this is how Muslims are acting upon it today, uh -huh. and these things are problematic in various ways because obviously the Christians in Egypt are being victimized on the basis of people acting upon the texts and teachings of Islam. And uh, Muhammad uh, is an excellent example of conduct who leads the people who follow him into various kinds of immoral behavior mm -hmm. and so on. And uh, of course they have a, uh, uh, he's on the hit list and he lives in hiding, uh, but he's a man of extraordinary courage and great wit and uh, immense grace. Uh, I highly recommend for uh, Arabic speakers his television show and have run a few uh, summaries of oh, some of them good. on Jihad Watch and we can now, find them there. Here at Franciscan University we're very fond of St. Francis and the story yeah. of St. Francis and the Sultan often gets retold in funny ways to make it seem as though he's just simply pioneering a kind of ecumenical dialogue. How did it really happen? Well, St. Francis was actually trying to convert the Sultan to Christianity, right. and so he thought that uh, the best way would be to demonstrate the power of the true God. And uh, after the pattern of uh, Elijah uh, and others, he offered to uh, uh, actually immolate himself and uh, have the Imams set themselves on fire. And the one who was put out, that would be the one whose God was true. But the Imams did not uh, want to take him up on that offer. Oh, all right. But he was not uh, reaching out in the sense of contemporary dialogue where uh, differences are minimized. Often differences that ought to be discussed are ignored and downplayed in favor of some kind of spurious uh, harmony. Th to say that St. Francis was exemplary of something like that or that he was just uh, having some sort of ecumenical talks, that's, uh, that's historical anachronism. Now. Right. What about Blessed Charles de Foucault? I mean, the last century we have somebody more recent. Yes. Blessed Charles de Foucault is an extraordinary man who uh, lived a life of uh, a certain licentiousness as a youth. And uh, he was very interested in Islam to the degree that ultimately he went to live uh, as a hermit in North Africa and was ultimately murdered by uh, Islamic supremacists there. But uh, w many things noteworthy about him, he was just devoting himself to prayer. He didn't preach. He knew the uh, restrictions and the suspicions that Muslims have about Christ and Christianity and Christians. But he just thought he would live a life that would be exemplary and attractive. And uh, what's, uh, I think, most noteworthy about Blessed Charles is that one of the reasons why he devoted his life to Christ and to the church uh, rather than become a Muslim was that he knew because of his early life that the Islamic vision of paradise, which is this uh, uh, carnival of uh, sensual delights, he knew that that was not the supreme happiness because he had tasted that and he knew right. that the yeah. soul was still longing. Yeah. And so he realized, well, this could not possibly be a true faith because of its vision of yeah, the that, that the carnal good. delights don't exactly exhaust the capacity we have for happiness. Precisely. You know, another example, even more recent, would be that splendid movie that came out uh, a year of or the monks so of Tiburon. 
right, uh, yeah. of gods and men. I yes. mean, their witness is very much in the spirit of, of, of Charles de Foucault. Yes, very they true. Too end up, and and they end up, movie, I mean, they're, they're, they're murdered. Uh, yeah. They become martyrs uh, uh, to the faith. Well, and they're witnesses of, of, of hospitality uh, to their Arab neighbors. They're, they're not provoking anybody. Yes. But they're targeted by these people. Because they're Christian. Because they're Christian. This is what happened. I, you know, I mean, in what, what the Germans did to the Jews was not because of something the Jews had done, but because of who they were that they became objects of hatred. Your very being uh, is repulsive, and we've got to sweep uh, the board clean yes. of, uh, of Jewry. Now, the difference here, uh, that's an exact parallel, but with one caveat, and that is that if the monks, or if any Christian in that context, converts to Islam, yeah. then everything I is okay. Right. Yeah. And those, so that is always an out. But otherwise, yes, then your existence itself is an insult. Right. You know, another courageous example would be Pope Benedict and the Regensburg Address. Yes. What happened there? I mean, can you summarize? Certainly. Uh, Pope Benedict quoted uh, the patriarch, the, not the patriarch, the Byzantine emperor, Manuel II Palaiologos, who was uh, late 14th century. And he said that there is nothing new or original in what Muhammad taught except what is evil and inhuman. And uh, actually, the Holy Father quoted that uh, only in passing in order to illustrate another point. But that was what the uh, Islamic world fastened upon and demanded apologies. And there were actually riots and people killed in uh, Afghanistan and uh, Somalia and uh, some other places, I believe, uh, because of this. Right. And the, uh, the thing was is that there is a great deal, as you had mentioned earlier, Scott, in the Quran that does exhort to piety and to behavior that is, uh, by any standard, completely righteous. At the same time that there are these strange lacunae in the uh, Islamic vision of morality, right. the, the, the child marriage, the polygamy, and so on, yeah. the temporary marriage among the Shiites, and things that mitigate its, its moral witness. But there are good things that you know, are it's, taught it's in the Quran. It's important, I think, to historically contextualize the development of Islam. I was reading Professor Iman's book on uh, Islamic natural law th mm -hmm. theories, and uh, this professor traces how there was a hard natural law tradition at the, in, at the inception of Islam that slowly becomes soft and then voluntaristic yes. until finally what we would know as natural law is sort of repudiated in, in favor of a, a hard sharia that yes. it is the will of Islam, pure and simple, see, that natural reason doesn't see the inner logic of a law that perfects and fulfills us as humans. There, there's no, uh, natural theology, the idea of natural law and the idea of a rational systematic theology is completely alien to Islam right. and the Quran. There's a passage in the Quran, chapter five, verse 64, it says the Jews say that Allah's hand is chained uh -huh. and no, may their hands be chained. Now what does it mean that Allah's hand is chained? It, it, he's it bound by covenant. Precisely. Yeah. But in, 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 Islam, in Islam, he's not bound by anything right, at all. That's right. He's not a father who would bind himself to a family yeah. and love his children. He's and a master. I mean, it, would, it would be unthinkable yes. for a Muslim to utter the Lord's Prayer, our Father. I mean, that oh, is right. anathema. Absolutely. Our yeah. master. The Quran says, our the Jews father. say, we are children of Allah and his beloved. And if that's so, then say to them, then the Jews and Christians say, then why does he punish you for your sins? Which is oh. kind of odd because why wouldn't a father punish a child who's disobedient? But in any case, it's just explicitly repudiated in that passage that Allah is the father of right. human and, beings. And so look, any claim that there was a strong sense of natural law even from the beginning has to be qualified or tempered by, by these facts. That's but right. even though the Quran lock, lacks a, a perhaps a systematic approach, there is an inner logic and a system here and I believe that it, it, it bears directly upon their notion of God and their notion of humans. Right. Humans, for, 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 that, for Islam, unlike for the Judeo-Christian tradition, are not created in God's image and likeness. Right. There was no, no parity, no point of contact. There's no notion, right. therefore, that the fulfillment of yeah. human life would be metaphysical union with that God. Right. And yes. therefore, that leads to yeah. making either carnal or material or created right. things right. the uh, <clears throat> the great good of, of human life mm -hmm. in this life and in the next. Yeah. Yes. So there is an inner logic, even if it's not set out systematically. And we consistently and it, it also it, it also would legitimize the exercise of violence, exactly pursuant it, to it, it, it making degrades. the world Muslim. It oh yeah, it's a degrading I mean, the, view. Even though this exhortation to violence is antithetical to reason. Uh, uh -huh. it, that God is above reason. 
Yes. He's not subject even to the word. Maimonides, the Jewish, medieval Jewish philosopher, he writes very interestingly about his dealings with Muslim philosophers. And he said that, essentially, he said they drove him crazy <laughs> because they would never acknowledge that God might operate the universe according to consistent and observable laws. They thought that would be a blasphemous limitation. Because he would be bound, as power. it were. You know, I remember I had an sand. experience where I was scheduled to debate an Islamic philosopher on the subject of God and the Trinity. Mm -hmm. And this was months away, but we were able to arrange for a breakfast. And in that breakfast, it got really tense because accidentally I referred to God as Father, and he interrupted me and said I blasphemed. So oh. lightly I changed the subject. We shifted to Jesus, and I referred to him as the Son of God, and he pounded his fist a second time and interrupted me and said, I will not accept this blasphemy. There is no divine sonship. And so I tried to find common ground on the basis of analogy, saying, well, look, you know, we, we have power and God is pure power. We have goodness and God is infinite goodness. You know, we have knowledge and God is all knowing and we are good and sometimes show mercy and love and God is perfectly, Allah is that. You know, why not just take it in terms of fatherhood, that we have fatherhood that's flawed and Allah has fatherhood that is perfect and that is the context. And he, and he stared intently back at me and he said, because Allah doesn't love as a father. And he proceeded to describe his relationship to his pet and how he was going to move into a new apartment. And in fact, you know, it didn't allow pets. And so he said, I may have to kill my pet. No. And I was astonished, you know, and the conversation broke down. The debate was eventually canceled. But what really happened to me was he provoked me to a kind of intellectual awakening where I began to realize that the things that we take for granted as Christians, oh, yes. God's fatherhood, Christ's sonship, that we're the children of God, that we're made in the image and likeness of God, none of this is acceptable. Yes. That it is a master-slave relationship oh, yes. that is metaphysically projected onto the universe and historically played out in terms of slavery, in terms of dimitude, in terms of polygamy, concubinage, and terror. And, and most poignantly, heaven cannot be, cannot be the vision yeah. the mystical, intimate vision of the divine essence. It cannot be. No. There's no ground for parity. There's no claim. There's yeah. no Therefore, basis. if the vision is not of God's essence, then it has to be of something yeah. created. There's no other option. This it's kind of dialogue yeah. between Christians and Muslims is necessary. Yeah. And at times it's been fruitful. But I think we have to recognize it's a lot harder than we want to admit. Oh, very, very hard. Well, the conversation seems to be suggesting that there's no basis, uh, there's no commensurability between the two. Uh, yes. Uh, what, what do we talk about? Well, I think that there's a, there's a possibility that if you have a Muslim who would be willing to be honest, uh -huh. now it might seem insulting that I would even suggest that they would not be honest in a discussion, uh, that it might be fruitful, but the reality is that uh, Islam also has a doctrine of deception uh -huh. and that it's permitted. Uh, chapter 3 verse 28 says that don't take believers in preference, don't take unbelievers in preference to believers as your friends and protectors unless you're doing it to guard yourselves against them, which is understood in Islamic tradition as meaning that under certain circumstances you can deceive unbelievers for the advantage of Islam and that's, uh, so that makes dialogue virtually impossible. Well, you know, this segment has flown by. When we return, each of us will share our final thoughts on Catholics and Islam. Stay with us. My name is Kelly Butler, and I'm a communication arts major. I took independent digital filmmaking. Definitely intense. Many all-nighters in the editing lab getting things done. Pope John Paul II has a quote, Do not be afraid to go out into the streets and into public places to preach Christ like the first apostles. That's what we're called to as Catholics and as Christians. You have that responsibility that every work you create should reflect Christ. Franciscan University is academically excellent and passionately Catholic. Explore the treasures of your Catholic heritage on a Franciscan University pilgrimage. Led by inspiring spiritual directors, you'll walk in the footsteps of saints and martyrs in the Holy Land, Poland, France, and Italy. And you'll deepen your love for Jesus Christ through daily mass, confession, prayer, and the joy of Christian fellowship. Let Franciscan University lead you on a pilgrimage of faith. Find out more at franciscan.edu slash pilgrimages. Well, we've come to the end of our discussion on Catholics and Islam, and it's time for some final words 
from our panelists. Regis, you can go first. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks so much for uh, the job you've done today. You've uh, orchestrated the discussion uh, very well. And uh, thank you in particular, uh, Robert, for thank coming, you. for your splendid witness. I mean, you're a man who I think has very much the courage of the convictions uh, uh, that you possess, and, and that is rare uh, and most uh, refreshing. I mean, you're erudite, uh, but you're also, I, I think, uh, fearless. Uh, and uh, I, I want to applaud you and encourage you in, in this, this apostolate. Uh, and it's always a delight to be with my uh, esteemed colleague, uh, uh, Michael Cirilla, who I think touched on a theme that I'd like to sort of embroider upon uh, for a half minute or so. Uh, the theme of the image of God, imago dei, the anthropological uh, shortcoming we find in, uh, in Islam. Uh, Pope John Paul I, whom nobody remembers, uh, but I do, uh, he lasted about a month. But, but one of his signature statements was, we are the amazement of God, that there is something imperishably important and precious about being a child of God an image of God who strives after the perfect likeness of God. And, and this is an ancient theme in, in Catholic literature, both devotional and polemical. We find this in Irenaeus, the great founder of Western theology, who tells us that the glory of God is man fully alive. And, and there's a text, I think, in, in the wisdom literature of the Old Testament where God literally genuflects before man because of the image that he espies, that configures and, and, and inscribes the whole constitution of this created being. I mean, this is the teaching of the church. It was, it was struck like granite uh, in the 13th century at the Fourth Council of the Lateran, the great analogy of being. We are like God. There is a similarity. Of course, at the heart of that similarity, we're struck by the radical dissimilarity. Uh, and, and so on the basis of all this, it does seem mighty difficult to find a common point of, of, of entry uh, with our Muslim friends and neighbors. But we've got to try anyway. But it's difficult when you think of people who sanction suicide bombers. I mean, what on earth do we share with these people? Well, one thing, a human heart. They have the same longings we have, and we have to persuade them that the longing for ultimate human happiness can only come as a result of acknowledging God as father, not simply as master, and ourselves as children, not simply as uh, subjects. Mike, well, thanks for inviting me here once again. And Robert, thank you very much for your work. It's been a pleasure to get to know you and, and discuss uh, Islam and the faith um, today. Uh, Regis, you, you hit uh, at the heart, I think, of, of, of um, the issue. On the one hand, there's a disjunct. We, we don't share a view exactly with, with Muslims that humans are in the image and likeness of God. And yet, we are all humans, and we are all in the image and likeness of God. And at the heart of that likeness, of course, we also in our tradition hold that there's a greater dissimilarity between us and God than there is a similarity, but yet, there is a similarity. And that similarity hits upon the depths of our being, our personhood, and that we have a rational soul. We can know and we can love. And our Muslim brothers and sisters have that and they know it. And that's a point of, that's a point of for dialogue to occur, there has to be some commonality, common language, common topic to discuss. Okay. Here we're discussing the truth about the world <coughs> and God. The commonality pre-exists. However, we may recognize it, fail to do so, speak about it, or be mistaken about our expressing of our understanding of it. So I think that perhaps the beginning of the uh, dialogue would be on a more philosophical and human level, on a personal level. And of course, I think an essential feature of dialogue for it to be successful is some kind of friendship. And yes, there are impediments, certainly, to, to friendship. And they're written in, perhaps, even to the, the canonical texts of Islam. And nevertheless, we're committed to it. And that's the Christian way, is to love everyone um, and, and to pray for everyone. 
That's a great point. I mean, Muslims are made in the image and likeness of God, whether they affirm it or not. Yeah. Yes. And so that's where the conversation begins with yeah. the help of the Holy Spirit. Robert, your turn. Well, I want to thank you also for uh, the wonderful job you've done today and uh, for making this possible. And uh, thank you, uh, Regis and Mike. It's a very interesting discussion, and I much appreciate it. And in terms of the things that you're saying about the image of God and that uh, you know, Muslims are indeed created in the image of God like everybody else, this is uh, very important, and there is a port of entry in the Quran to discuss this with Muslims because uh, the, while it is denied in Islamic theology that we are created in the image of God, at the same time there is a uh, Jewish rabbinical tradition that's repeated several times in the Quran that when God created Adam, he summoned all the angels and ordered them to prostrate themselves before Adam. Now, the only explanation for this is because Adam bears the image of God in a way that even the angels do not. And Satan refuses and is cast out of heaven as a result of his disobedience. Now, this is, is, is imported like so many things in the Quran from Jewish tradition, and there are also many imports from Christian tradition, but it's never explained. And so one thing that can happen in dialogue, and there are many other elements of the uh, teachings of the Quran about Jesus, the being the virgin birth, being the word of God, and so on, and the idea of the second coming in Islamic tradition, these things are left unexplained, mm -hmm. and they can be used as the basis for a dialogue, for a discussion, to try to provoke thought in our Muslim friends and say, how is it that these things are taught? What do they mean? And could they possibly have this import that we give them in Christian teaching? Great. Well, I think this leads us to recognize this one fundamental point, the difference between Allah and Abba, between a master and a father, between slaves and sons and daughters. And I think when we look at it that way, we realize that the Holy Spirit is what caused sinners like us to discover God's fatherhood. And the arm of the Lord is not shortened that he cannot save Muslims as well as people like us. And so that gives us great confidence, but not in ourselves or in our own powers of dialogue. I'm reminded of a text in Proverbs 17, verse 2. A slave who deals wisely will rule over a son who acts shamefully. <laughs> and it's a wake-up call for those who, have given, who are given this gift of divine sonship. And also 1 John 2, 22, this is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. I mean, this is what led our medieval forebearers to acknowledge that there's something here at root that is not really right at all. You know, and I think what I would, would want to say in the, in the closing is get Robert's books. <laughs> You've written over 10 and uh, read them. Learn Arabic, you know, it, to really plunge yourself into the new evangelization and maybe into a well-paying job in the government or the economy as well. But uh, Jonathan Riley Smith, uh, Rodney Stark's books, you know, God's Battalions, uh, so many other sources too. And I also want to mention that we have a free handout, uh, a free handout about today's program that you can receive simply by contacting us. It's excerpts from the book that uh, Robert Spencer co-authored, Inside Islam, A Guide for Catholics. The handout includes excerpts from the chapter, Sharing the Gospel with Muslims. This is yours, free for the asking. That's all we have time for right now, but we hope you'll join us next time for Franciscan University Presents. To receive a free handout on today's topic or to purchase a video of this show, call 888-333-0381. That's 888-333-0381. Or call 740-283-6357. Email your request to presents at franciscan.edu or write to Franciscan University Presents, Franciscan University of Steubenville, 1235 University Boulevard, Steubenville, Ohio, 43952.